It's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in Perth to, uh, to speak with you today and, uh, and address this topic of, uh, of non-eaters. I uh, hope you don't mind. In the feedlot industry, we tend to call it non-eaters. We, we can't get our head around the fancy words. So um, we're going to, that's what we're going to deal with today. And I'm going to look at it from probably a bit of a different perspective to what has happened in, the, um, uh, in a lot of the research. Um, and I've been involved with the cattle industry, the feedlot industry, since 1987. And, and these guys are the coolest things I've ever met. They're honest. They tell you the truth. They don't bullshit. They do as you ask. And um, a lot of time we forget that. A lot of time we forget that we're always communicating with them whether or not we actually want to. So we have... Um, I'm going to talk about stockmanship today. I'm not going to, and stockmanship is the foundation of the success that we have with managing these cattle. And the techniques that we have of, that I use and I train people in has been developed by, by two main people, Dr. Tom Nofsinger, who some of you will know, and Dr. Paulo Laredo. And Paulo's from Brazil, and he invented, he coined the, the term nothing in the hands. So when we handle cattle, we don't use any sticks and flags. We don't use any hot shots. We don't use a big old broomstick with a bag on the end or, uh, or anything. We don't use anything. You don't need anything. Cattle hate that sort of stuff. All we use is ourselves. We just use the way we move. So that's, that's the language of these cattle. And we're going to explore that a little bit. But the thing is, the key is we want to bring cattle, horses, and people together. For 50 years, people have been trying to take people away from the cattle, building facilities with heaps of steel and concrete so that the people can't even see the cattle. I see people hiding from them. What the hell do you want to hide from them for? They know you're there anyhow. So people do stupid stuff because they actually don't understand these animals. So we're going to talk about understanding these animals. We're going to talk about how to talk to a cow. I want each and one of you to go out there when you leave this place and go back to your properties to go out there and say good day to your cows. Actually talk with them, interact with them, get them to do cool stuff for you. So let's, get, let's cut to the chase. Why don't cattle eat or drink like these two in the picture? They're not eating, they're not drinking. We used to think they were sick. We used to think they had pneumonia. We'd drag them out of the pen and give them antibiotics. They don't need antibiotics. They haven't got pneumonia. They're not eating and they're not drinking. If they eat and they drink, they'll be well. If they're well, they'll thrive and they won't get sick. So this is a big question, and you have it in the, fee in the live export jobs, a big deal with the sheep. Sheep aren't much different to cattle, they're just five times smaller, but they pretty much think the same, do the same stuff. The cool thing is, or the interesting thing is that cattle can live anywhere. Anywhere you can think of, any environment, you will find cattle. So why is it different with confinement? What is different about confinement which means that these animals are going to struggle? Some of it's to do with the change of address. We pick them up from this here pasture, we stick them on a truck, and we send them to this luxurious hotel. That's a big change of address. That's like going off to boarding school for the very first time. Lots of people there you don't know, got to do stuff, we've got to eat when the feed truck comes around, got to wait your turn to have a drink. So it's a big deal. It's a big, big deal, this change of address. Cattle graze in the pasture. Look at this guy. What, why do some animals want to starve themselves to death? This guy's on the way. He's dehydrated. He hasn't eaten for four or five days, maybe six days. This one, we can explain it. If you ever look at his head, he's had his horn knocked off. That horn knocked off happened at processing, and that was enough to stop this animal from wanting to eat or drink. And it will perish if someone doesn't intervene. This shouldn't happen. That's cattle handling stuff. That's people not caring enough. Look at this guy. We used to pull him from pneumonia. He ain't got pneumonia. This guy doesn't eat and drink. Why doesn't he drink? He's not eating and drinking because these three bitches at that water trough won't let him have a drink. They're the boss. He can't get near them. So he, she's quite prepared just to sit there and perish because she is not confident enough to face up to those three. She lacks the confidence to actually push in and have a drink. 
So what did we do? This is that mob of cattle. We gave them some exercise. We took them for a walk. We changed their address. We gave them a new home. We put them in a new home. And when we put them in a new home, everything's different. It's a new place. Even though it looks exactly the same as the last pen, it's actually, for the cattle, it's a new place. We've reset the herd. The herd has to re-establish itself. And this time, these animals now have renewed confidence because they may not be the dominant animals. And those three that were dominant might have been the first animals in that cohort that came in. So lots has been made about all these stressors that cause cattle to have problems. And they're pretty important. And we can break them into a few groups. We can break them into nutritional stuff, right? A change of address, different food, all this sort of jazz. Maybe no food. We can have physical stressors like processing, trucking, slipping over, getting beaten up, dogs chewing their heads off, that sort of stuff. We can have environmental stressors, heat, cold, rain, mud, blizzards, dust storms like you can't see across the other side of the pen. So we have some environmental challenges that confront them. We have physiological stuff. The biggest one of these is dehydration and protein loss just from being days off food in transit. Huge problem, physiological changes. And then we have psychological changes. Psychological changes get forgotten about a little bit because people don't really understand them and think it's too scary or think it's dumb and crazy. Well, that's me. Um, because psychological trauma is a big deal. Confinement anxiety. These cattle here on this video, if you watch it while I talk about this segment, these cattle are Mickey Bulls from the Cape in Queensland. Most of these are three and four years old. They brought into this feed yard, the first line time they came into the feed lot, about, they couldn't get them out of the pen, they killed everybody. About four or five percent of them died of starvation. The next year we came and worked with these cattle, we acclimated these cattle, and you can see some of these are pretty, pretty fractious sort of guys, they're not the sort of fellow you're just going to go and pat up with them. So that confinement anxiety changes these animals a lot. But we can change them. You've got to believe and you've got to know that you can change these animals within minutes. Within 20 minutes, we had this group of cattle, 150 Mickey bulls, walking out of that pen in single file, one at a time. 100 days later, when they went on the truck, there were two that wouldn't adapt and died. But those cattle were well behaved, walked on the truck, no problems, no dark cutters. It was an amazing thing. When you can buy these animals for 80 or 90 cents, that's a pretty good deal. These two Herefords over here, my veterinary students tell me they got IBR and pneumonia. They ain't, they're brothers. They come from the same place. They hate where they are. They just don't like where they are. They are really struggling with relocation. And Herefords are really cool animals. They've got a completely different mindset on life. This guy here, well, someone's been kind enough to give him some molasses, and all he's done is eat the molasses. His manure is just molasses. He's not thriving. He just is confined. He is just messed up in the head, and he's not confident enough to eat and drink. He doesn't trust that pen. He doesn't trust that water. He doesn't trust the people who come there. So he's not going to eat. He doesn't have to eat. And then eventually, other processes take on, and then they, it's a negative feedback, and they continually not eat. So we changed some stuff up. In the last 15 years since I got involved with trying to understand cattle better, we changed stuff up. This particular feed yard here had a major problem with um, both digestive or non-eaters and with lameness. So we changed the way we handled them. This guy here is putting these cattle through this bud box and up this alley, four at a time. They're processing 1,200 head a day. This completely eliminated their injuries, musculoskeletal injuries. And here's what happened. You can see that big drop off on the graph. That's when we put in the, changed the handling, put in the bud box. The number of crippled cattle went from about six a day to zero. Three a month is what they get. Three a month. These guys move a lot of cattle. They move in 2,000 head a week, in and out. They get three lame cattle a month. Three lame cattle a month. And all we did was change the way the people worked with those animals. Change the way so the people decided they might respect them a little bit more. And uh, it changes things. It changes things a lot. Acclimation, we call it. Big fancy word, but what it means 
It means building trust, means building confidence, and getting rid of anxiety. So this is, a, this is a group of Brahmins up in North Queensland when I was fortunate enough to spend some time working with some Austrex guys on doing some cattle handling. This was preparation cattle. And this handler here is doing a beautiful job. He's asking these cattle to walk single file past him. He's rewarding them. Every time they do something positive, they get rewarded. These cattle are looking for guidance. They're looking to him. If he interacts with those cattle, it'll be a positive event. If he ignores them, then those cattle will, ignoring cattle is as good as being abusive. Not, you, not doing anything is not an option. You're either positive or you're negative. There's no neutral here. These guys were magnificent. These guys were beaten up pretty bad. About six of them broke their legs coming off the truck into this pen. There's 1,200 of them. And I'd never acclimated a group of 1,200 head before in my life. The guys running this depot said, get the hell out of there, they'll end up in Darwin. Oh, yeah, sure. These things were walking single file down the fence line for us within 20 minutes. Every single last one got paid attention. It was, it was very rewarding. You can see they haven't eaten, but they smashed their feed that night and they were looking for feed the next morning. Acclimation builds trust. Confidence reduces anxiety. This is another group. You don't have to do it on foot. You can do it on horseback. And this is a friend of mine who's helped me a lot. Um, he's a stockman, helped, helped me a lot with this, understanding this stuff. And together, we have developed some magnificent techniques which have really changed some of the feed yards which we work at. This is acclimation at its best. One guy, 250 head of cattle, working them around the pen, asking these cattle to walk from corner to corner in a single file and to come to the feed bunk. He does a magnificent job. The feed truck comes by here in a minute, but I think our editing sort of messed up a bit. And all these cattle walk to the bunk. So we won't wait for the whole thing. It takes five minutes. He spends five minutes with these cattle. Acclimation encourages cattle to exercise. It, we want them to exercise with exuberance. We want them to play. We want them to feel good about themselves. And they will. This exercise stimulates them, stimulates them to eat and stimulates them to drink. They eat and they drink. Their immune system will function. They will thrive. They will not get sick. They will not get salmonella. They don't have any problems if, you, if they eat and they drink. They've lived for thousands of years. Why the hell do they die in the last 50 days when they're in a feed yard, the last 70 days? Some basic cattle handling. We're not going to talk too much about the cattle handling and the, and the techniques, but I wanted to show you this because this is these, the Austrian guys that I work with doing a magnificent job at putting these cattle up the race. We're going to send batches of nine up there to get processed. These cattle have been through these facilities seven times already. The guys around the facility said, oh, they're impossible to work with. Well, we had to look at what they were doing, and I know why it was impossible to work with. So Warwick here works from the front. He shows these cattle where he wants them to go. He's zigzagging across the entrance. Moves over a little bit, puts some gentle pressure at 45 degrees to the corner, and picks off nine. The nine head go. He sends them on their way. He looks where he wants them to go, and these cattle go straight up that alleyway. No stick, no flag, no hollering, no nothing. And this happened all day. 700 of these things all day, bam, batches of nine. You've got to have the correct size of the draft. Most people get too many. Most people are greedy because they're lazy. Cattle go single file. They love to go single file. Take two to bring ten. Those first two will bring the rest of the cattle behind them. We, my goal in life is to have every feed yard processing cattle, every feed yard working all their cattle off horseback. Horses love cattle. Cattle love horses. And here's an example of young Haley. She's bringing a draft of about five head to go through these cattle up for re-implant. Round they come. This is the tub, all sheeted in, but she's in there with them, and that little horse is, providing, is applying gentle pressure on these cattle, and each one of them will go up that alleyway. They go up that alleyway because of what she's done, because of her respect and what she's done in the backyard, setting those cattle up go up there. There's nobody bringing those cattle. Those cattle are voluntarily walking up that race. Stockmanship. Bring the people to the cattle. Stop taking the people away from the cattle. Understand the language of cattle. Train the people and train the cattle. This builds their confidence 
and it creates respect and understanding for the people, for the cattle, but also for the cattle to the people. It takes away anxiety. It builds trust. It decreases the risk of injury to the cattle and it decreases the injury to the people. The people actually know and understand what these cattle are doing. Cattle do the same stuff all the time. They're every time animals. There's nothing, there's no surprises in them. Their language isn't verbal. They don't know Spanish or English or Australian. What they understand is their position. They understand how far away you need to be. They understand how you approach them, what angle you approach them, and they understand when you stop and when you start and how you move. That's their language. It's not, come on, come on, God, come on. It's not other stuff. It's not ooh-ah, ooh-ah. It's not whistle. It's, not, it's none of that. They don't give a damn about that. That just frightens them and creates and makes them anxious. So in my mind, what's coined low-stress handling is successful communication with these animals. So let's talk a little bit about acclimation and non-eaters. Oh, this thing keeps stopping. I'm going to show you four feed yards that I work with on doing acclimation. This is what happened to their digestive problems. Here's the first one, their digestive problem. We started here in about 2012 on this yard, one of the first yards they ever did this with, and over the years you can see those digestive problems disappeared. Here's another one, not so long, started in, 1914, in 2014, only about three or four years. It took about one year before the people got confident in what they were doing. Digestive pulls have disappeared. Here's another one. This one here, we just started it more recently as well. Did some training, did some work with him. Digestive deaths, digestive pulls have disappeared. And lastly, another one that started in 2014, been a slow progression down, and we had a little hiccup there where they had some change of management and change of staff. Problems started to come back, got them back on, truck, on track. Non-eaters, digestive problems have disappeared. So there's no one in this audience who's going to try and tell me that you can't Get rid of digestive problems by using cattle handling techniques. This is not about drugs. This is not about any of that sort of stuff. This is about understanding animals, building up their confidence so that they are prepared to eat and drink and work for you and look forward to seeing you every day. There's a couple more. So just a little bit of, little bit of theory. I'm not, my little clock has gone out here, so I don't know where we're up to. Cattle are prey animals, you all know that. And as prey animals, they understand predators. And they consider you to be a predator. You're this guy. You're that guy. You're a cougar. She's a cougar. Predatory instincts create negative behavior. If you behave like a predator, those cattle will behave in a negative way. But they're forgiving. Their future behavior is, is determined by each handling. And even if they've been handled poorly, you can change them very quickly, within minutes. Within minutes, you can change these animals. Human contact shapes their behavior. Every interaction can be positive or negative. This is a sensitive group of cattle that come from Flinders Island. Flinders Island is some of the most sensitive cattle I've ever met from the, the Boss Taurus breed. These guys were very sensitive. But... Even these sensitive animals are looking for direction. They're looking for interaction. They're looking for guidance. Not interacting is not an option. It's negative. These animals are, are behaving beautifully. They're walking. They're looking. We're interacting with them. They straighten their heads out. They take a few steps. That's all they want. Every handling should be seen as an opportunity to interact with these animals and shape the way they behave. Every single handling. And that handling could be just simply walking past the bunk. You're walking past the bunk, all those animals are looking at you. Some of them want to interact with you. So all you need to do is look at him and take a couple of steps away just to take that pressure off and then go back and just back up a little bit just as you're walking away. Drop your eyes. Interact with those animals because every one of them is watching you. Every single one. And that's what's amazing. They want to know what's going on. And they know whether you're a cool dude or whether you're an mm, asshole. They don't care. There are lots of opportunities. We don't seem to have any sound. There are five concepts. Human, concept, human contact shapes their behavior. We need to understand the predatory-prey relationship. 
It's a non-verbal communication. We need to know how to present ourselves properly to these animals. We need to know how to say hello to a cow. We need to know that, and we need to do that often. And we need to know about acclimation. We need to know how to interact with these animals. We now need to know how to make them comfortable so they want to eat and they want to drink and they want to rest. This is, a, this is an interesting case. This is a client of mine where in 2012 I first was asked to visit them. When I went there, this is an Angus place, long-fed cattle. Their feedlot entry cattle were eating 100 grams a day. I was sick, lots of sick cattle. We even had salmonella. We don't see a lot of salmonella in cattle. We had salmonella in these cattle, 100 grams a day. After 10 days, they were eating 4 kilos. Injury weight was 380 to 420. They got slaughtered at 700 kilos, low weight, and that was taking 240 days to do. They grew at one and a quarter kilos a day, and their mortality was 4.5%. So we changed a few things up. We, did a, we put in some basic acclimation techniques and some preparation of those cattle before they came to the feed yard, some vaccination stuff. There was no pre-arrival handling. All the handling was done at the feedlot. And a year later, we had them eating 6.5 kilos at feedlot entry. They were eating 10 kilos by day 10, which is my benchmark target, 10 by 10. In weight was a little better, 400 to 440. They were now 750 kilos. Out weight, 180 days. That was a lot of money to these guys. Grew at 1.8 a day. Their death loss was now 0.7%, which I was pretty happy with. That's a lot of money. We knocked 60 days off the feeding period. 60 days. That's a lot of money. Wasn't good enough for these guys. They said, we need to do better. So we did the preparation stuff, and then we cut the property up into paddocks. We put these cattle in the paddocks after they were processed, acclimated in the paddock. Most people don't do that. Most people chuck them in the paddock and forget about them. But we purposely put two people out there every day, seven paddocks every day, until the cattle were happy and I acclimated these cattle in the paddock. The last lot of data I got was two months ago, and for the 2017 year to date, we now had these cattle eating 14 kilos when they walked into the feedlot. The very first day they put in a feedlot pen, they ate 14 kilos of feed. These cattle were eating nearly 20 kilos by day 10. Their entry weight was a bit bigger, a bit bigger because they did some growth in the paddock, of course. Their out weight is 770 kilos, 150 days. This is amazing. These cattle are too big for their market, so we're going to have to take some days off the front. This is nothing about, there's no fancy drugs here, there's no implants, there's no nothing in these cattle. This is just people looking after cattle. That's all this is. People acclimating cattle. People building these animals' confidence up. People who put them onto the race properly. People who put them onto the scales properly. People who don't make any noise around them. All you hear is the cattle's feet. Nothing else. It's the most beautiful sound. It's just cattle's feet without some clown hollering in the background. Here's a study just completed by Iowa State. This was presented at the ABPP meeting uh, in um, Omaha just recently. Two-day wean Florida calves, 2,000 head, were brought in the feed yard. Split in half, traditional handling and alternative handling. So the traditional handling was you check the cattle from the alley. You don't go in there for the first four days. Just make sure nothing's dead. Day five, they got processed. After processing, pen riders would go in pen and do their pen check. The alternative was cattle would come in. We waited until the cattle started to wander around. So they were really exhausted, they rested, then they get up and they start wandering around. Once they started wandering around, we acclimated them. And in this particular study, the acclimation was very, very basic. The cattle were grouped in the corner. Once they were grouped in the corner, they were walked, pressure 45 degrees, walked up the fence to the bunk. They were then moved, removed from the bunk and taken to the back of the pen and brought to the bunk one more time. This took 15 minutes, twice a day. That was all that they did. They were processed, day five. Then after that, the cattle will walk down the alley every day for 10 days. Let out of the pen, someone let them out, brought them back in. That was all that was done. Dark cutters, no change. Sickness rate, no change. Death loss from respiratory disease, no change. Musculoskeletal losses, no change. Total death loss, no, a bit of a change. Total railers, no change. Look at the digestive losses. None. Not one digestive loss. 
in the alternative group. Not one. Not one out of a thousand. Half a percent out of the ones that were done traditionally. These cattle were just looked after, and it was very minimalist. It wasn't a lot of intensive activity. This was just a bit of interaction twice a day. The cost benefit for this is $10.58 per head in for the alternative treatment. It costs nothing. Okay. So we got that sound up down there? Okay. So my, my final comment to you is that non-eating and non-drinking is all about you. It's not about the cattle. They just eat fine and they just drink fine. It's about what we do to screw them up in their heads so that they're not confident enough to eat and drink in the environment we're putting them in. And with that, our goal is to have cattle that'll do this. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. That's time. This is my favorite video. Senorita She liked the two-step She liked the mambo Heats it up like a Texas Jalapeno Jalapeno, man Well, I get so hot Every time I kiss her Spin me around like an Amarillo Twister Take her for a ride in my El Camino.